started saying that I look like him. <laughs> and uh, since that Ruby Midwest, my ads are on most websites and Twitter is 1010. Uh, on Twitter, it, at Adcron, um, had that since I was like 12 years old, which according to PJ is like a couple years ago. Uh, I'm, I'm running. Is that better? Hello, can anybody hear me? Um, I own a, own is a big term. I freelance mainly uh, under Binary Noggin. Um, and I've been doing that for four years. I really love it. And I also have been doing a podcast called This Agile Life uh, for about four years. And it's been a whole lot of fun. I get invited to conferences to interview people, um, but not often to speak. Uh, and kind of like Johnny, Johnny has seven kids for you guys that don't know. Um, I like to spawn lots of processes too. That's my family. I have five kids. <coughs> um, if, if anybody else has quite a few kids, you understand that this picture is kind of a magical feat. Uh, everybody's smiling. Most of them had their eyes open, and about five seconds after this, it was like Dante's Inferno. <laughs> no one poked me, he punched me in the face. Um, and so it was great, but I realized after spawning lots of processes that we really are an umbrella app. Um, this talk's not about umbrella apps, though. <laughs> I just thought it was fitting. And that's actually what most of our family pictures look like. Somebody scared, people laughing. Um, but but really, this talk is about being a hippie, and and what does it mean to be a hippie? Well, festivals, obviously, um, and the kind of conferences. So we're all part way there, uh, and a lot of it is living free of constraints and allowing yourself to just enjoy life, uh, stay away from the man, do your own thing, uh, and and making your own things like clothes. Jewelry, all tolerant applications, macrame. Um, so I guess fault tolerant applications. Let's let's start out. Uh, I'll get to the meat of this now. Um, you might have kind of an idea of where I'm going now that I'm talking about living with freedom. But uh, recently, uh, I was working on some application and I had to write a password reset system for the application. Uh, and this is kind of what I have. This is pretty simplified, but I have a supervisor over password reset, and it talks to the database. And I started thinking about that data and what you store when you have a password reset. So someone comes into the site, they ask for their password to be reset, you set up a token, the token's very temporary. And I didn't want to pull in another dependency. Uh, like a key value store, so I just threw it in the database, but I wasn't really happy with it because I knew that that data was just going to go away in a short period of time. I didn't like that column sitting around like Josh said. I don't, null columns aren't great unless uh, you have a reason for it, and this was going to spend 90% of its time null, um, hopefully. And it's, it's very short-lived data too. Um, and the database is not always that fast. I'm not saying it's going to be that slow, but I kind of get a kick out of shaving just milliseconds off of things. So if I could get rid of that, that would be really awesome. Um, so I think Josh already left. Is Josh here? Oh, Josh! I put this slide in for you. Josh, the database is not your friend. <laughs> um, no, I'm not saying get rid of your database, although, hey, that might be. Um, so, I started learning Elixir uh, on and off a long time ago, and um, throughout my learning, uh, I saw some talks by Sasha, and he often has a picture of blue background, yellow squares of processes. So, I mimic that with uh, some sticky notes on my wall at the office, and because this, to me, is what I thought of when I thought of using Elixir or Lang is all these little processes talking to each other, but but I think Sasha has something missing whenever he puts this picture up there. There's these there's nothing here. There's no they, they, they might do things, but there's no data 
And I heard you can store data in processes. Does anybody know what these are? Anybody have a car that you can put these in? No? Okay. Nobody's going to admit that age? All right. I don't believe all of you. <laughs> um, so, so this is what I thought of. Is these are still all a bunch of processes, but they have some data in them. And you can use that data, but, but really, why? I mean, is it worth putting all this work in? People have made Memcache, they've made Redis, they've made a lot of different things that, that you could just pull in and use, and it wouldn't be that bad. So why waste your time to put this into your Elixir program yourself? And I said, uh, because of DDoS. Um, I don't know how well you guys can read that. I feel like I need to make it bigger. Um, I don't mean distributed denial of service, although I might have played off of that intentionally to try to build up some emotion in people, but, but it's a, an acronym that I use for dependencies. So you have libraries and other things that you have to pull in um, that may or may not be being maintained. So I wanted to reduce dependencies. Deployment, which you know, uh, Paul talked about deployment. It was, I didn't want to figure out how to configure something else. Um, I didn't want to make two new things talk to each other and then something else to monitor pay attention to all the time, is it up, is it down, is it taking up too much memory. Uh, and I, I needed less knowledge and less experts if I could stay in, in one location. <clears throat> the other option is uh, optimization. I mean, what's faster than, than going out to your database? And I, I frequently get in memory key value store, memcache, Redis, yeah, I mean, what, what's faster than that? How about not having a wire protocol? Not having to change data from one format to another just so you can pass it around. So you can get rid of that. Like, what's faster than an in-memory database? Um, your current application having it in memory? That works out pretty well. Security. And this is where a lot of people are like, well, what are you talking about? Uh, for every dependency that you pull in and every hole that you have to poke in a firewall and everything that you have that you're pulling into your ecosystem, you're increasing your attack footprint. So I have a new port open or I have this new software and we're already going to hopefully keep up with the Elixir releases, the early releases as we're moving along in our application. And a lot of these external dependencies get forgotten. So you miss the security output on Redis, which actually, I'm, I'm not trying to knock on Redis, but when I looked up some stuff about this, Redis had a security problem that they put out that they had a new one. They said, check the change log, and there was a link. And you click the change log link, and it went to Reddit, and that's where their change log was. And that, it just made me feel a little uncomfortable that Reddit is where they decided to store their change log. It's not in their, their repo or anything. And then I also looked up, um, Shodan, uh, or Shodan.com, is a search engine for Internet of Things. It's also a really great search engine for finding open databases. Uh, and if you type in Redis, uh, in the U.S. alone, recently I did a search and came up with 6,550 insecure instances of Redis. And a lot of them had a key store that uh, was called Kraken or something similar to that. I should have written that down. Um, and that came from a problem in Redis that was a couple years old. So people still had broken Redis instances from a couple years ago, which just pushed back to me and said, well, I hope I didn't install one of these, because they probably did. Um, and then the closer that I can get to not having these external dependencies, the closer I can get to a unikernel system. So a unikernel is a machine image, and when you deploy, it's a lot like deploying to a, an em, embedded system, and it's a pared down Linux kernel that has nothing, really your app is, is the OS. Uh, sometimes you, you don't have a lot of system calls, and Elixir and Erlang really lend themselves well to this. You can hop in remotely and get into IEX and have kind of terminal on your system, so you don't need many of the system services. You can be more secure. And 
last was, does anybody know this guy? Speaking of that conference. Uh, who, who knows who this is? Somebody. Uncle, Uncle, Bob. Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob gave a talk at Ruby Midwest in uh, 2011. And it was called Architecture of the Lost Years. And as I was thinking through this, I, I talked, I popped back to that talk, which for the most part I just thought was entertaining more than informative, but apparently it's made me learn a few things over the years. And he said, put off persistence as long as possible. You're probably not going to need it. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I thought, wow, that guy's nuts. I still think that, but. So I was like, well, okay, I've got a database. I don't really want to reach to it. I didn't go for that external dependency. I really want to live free. I want to see if I can live without the database. So I started talking to a friend about it, and he said, that doesn't sound like a hippie. You sound like a hoarder. And I thought, a what? That makes no sense to me. And he's like, no, I'm not that kind of hoarder. This kind of hoarder. I don't want to maintain that application. No way. So we settled on it, and really it's this kind of order. Um, those are all video games. I think I might uh, be comfortable living in there. Um, but, but the thing is, to be this kind of order, you have to figure out what you're dealing with. You need to classify your junk. You need to make sure you're putting it in the right place. And then you need to protect it, because I'm sure there are some people that might break into that house, too, for that stuff. So. And make sure it's good. So, first thing I wanted to think about was what are the types of data, and I came up with two. There's permanent, or well, permanent, and there's temporary data. So, permanent data I came up with two ideas. There's static permanent data, which is config files um, or things that you would actually store in code. Things that, in order to update, you would probably do a deploy. They're not. They're rarely changing. Hopefully, every week you're not changing where IP addresses are, or anything like that. Um, and so those things are, they're not good for a database. They're not really good for res. They might as well stay in some static files. And then there's permit changing. Uh, medical history, comments on a blog, uh, user's last name. It does change, but probably not that often. Um, so, those are, those are pretty decent things for you to store into a database. And then temporary data. And I, I keep asking people, like, but temporary data, what, what, is, what does that mean to you? And I kept getting these three words, temporal, transient, and ephemeral. I said, well, are these all the same thing? And people would argue and back and forth. And so I decided to look them up. So the first one, temporal, is relating to time. And that seemed like a pretty good thing to store in process, like weather. Um, I actually thought that uh, the password reset token is semi-related to this. I mean, most people don't ask for a password reset token and then come back six months later and reset their password. It's usually a fairly immediate thing, um, unless you're like me and you remember your password right after you request the token. Uh, transient is lasting only for a short time. So at first, I thought the word transient was like transporting, um, but but then it's for a short time. A lot is like a cache. A cache would be a great piece of transient data, and and I thought this because when I looked up ephemeral, it said lasting for a very short time. And what? And people argued with me over these being different. I was like, well, they're pretty much the same to me. So we decided that ephemeral was things being transported. They're very short periods of time. So, all right, we've got our app, got some background information. So how do we actually store data? And, and that's agent to the rescue. Uh, agents are, uh, if anybody's not used them, it's based on a gen server. And it's a great for storing simple data structures. Uh, there's no, con no conversion wire protocols right inside, and it's pretty quick. Uh, so that's what I did. I pulled out, I have a password reset, and a password reset hoard and a supervisor, and I probably should have swapped these so that the hoard, the hoard is where the data is stored. That's our agent. I probably should have swapped them so it would start up first. Um, but 
this isn't software, it's a picture, and it's too hard to swap. So, um, now the, the thing is about this is we are likely to have failure somewhere in this system. And with a single supervisor like this, if the password reset has our business logic in it, which is where we're most likely to have failure. If it fails too many times, then that supervisor will end up shutting everything down. And that's, that's not really what we want, but let's go ahead and, and look through the code of an agent. So the agent, whenever it first starts, the function up there that's passed in, the return value of that function is your starting data that is inside of your agent. And so we're going to give it an empty map, because a key value store is just a map, right? I don't need anything big, I don't need to write this. Need a key to a user. So in add, somebody had an agent up here yesterday and they had an update there. And that's what I started with too uh, until I learned about cast. It, so update and an agent, but, uh, you tell it to update the data and then you wait for it to send it back to you. It's a call. But cast, the second argument there is a function to put the token and the user that's passed in into our state inside of our agent, so it's save, <coughs> it's set it, and forget it. I don't care, just go ahead and put it there. And with a password reset token, even if there's a problem and you lose it, somebody can come back and click that button again, so that's not a big deal. And then we have get user, so again, we just fetch out of the map based on the token that's passed in, so it grabs from that state. And then a remove, because after they reset their password token, we don't want that token to be reused over and over. If somebody else gets their email and clicks that, changes the password. But, like I said, we could have crashes. So what about crashes? Uh, does anybody know this book? This book. All right, so, we. this is all about, in the agent, I wanted to be able to live that let it fail. And so I had to find a new hero. Agent wasn't going to do it for me. And this little guy down here in the very bottom, he's the, uh, the, the, the protagonist in this book. And his name is Hero Protagonist. So I, I, I just had to put it up there because we got crashing in here. So my hero is Jim Server. And I changed the, the supervisor patterns here. Um, and, and this is really important on how this works, is that I have some failover data, I have that hoard, and I have password reset. So hoard here is what is about to change, and failover data is something new. And you'll notice that we have a separate level of a supervisor in here. And since we have a separate level, um, supervisors by default have a certain number of resets in a certain amount of time, and it's three resets in five seconds before they just fail everything under them. So in our case, now we have three resets in five seconds from this supervisor for this, and if it dies, that top supervisor will restart this one and do it again. So now I can have nine resets in however seconds, 25 seconds, I don't know, I'm, uh, I'm not doing math, I don't know math. Um, and we still, from that password reset, I'm always going to return OK to the user anytime they ask for anything. So I can cast everything. I can put everything in the background in there, the selection of the user. So response times, when I tested this, went from 120 milliseconds, which is pretty good, to 56 microseconds. So that's way better, I thought. And the thing about GenServer is it allows you to have custom termination logic. But let's show the failover. It's a lot like what we had before. My failover data um, starts out with an empty map, and I'm still using an agent here, cast to add state. The uh, function for dumping the state normally takes the state in, but we don't care what it is. We're just going to override it. And then loading the state back out. But here's the, here's the, the secret sauce here is the JIT server. So the gen server, I'm, I'm leaving most of the code out. There's a, there's a whole lot of boilerplate in there. And then the add, remove, get user are based off of the agent that we had before because there's not a whole lot of change. 
But in the init, instead of setting that data in this guy to an empty map when he's restarted, we instead use the failover storage that was back here, and we say, hey, I, I want your state, so I ask for it to load. I get that state, but then on terminate, and this is what Gin Server gave me over agent, is on terminate, I get the last state that happened, if there is an exception, if the supervisor shuts it down for whatever reason, and I dump that state in the failover storage. So that when the supervisor starts me back up, I hit that in again, I say, hey, give me that back. So the, the big thing here is you can do many other things in this terminate callback and munge that data. Uh, you could write it off to a file so that this is failing over and over. You then have something that you can say, hey, maybe it's failing because my data is bad. Let's go see what that data is. But again, I have failure. And I really didn't want that port, even though it's going to dump its data off, I wanted to give an extra layer. And, and this is really the crux of all of this. Is if you want to start living like a hippie or a hoarder and, and being free of these constraints, you still have to watch out for yourself. And to watch out for yourself, you want to keep things that are going to fail often and push those to the bottom of your supervision trees. Whenever you're designing, the things near the bottom, like I showed, told you earlier, is that we can reload over and over based on the supervisors up above. So I have more chances of failure before I have a problem. And, and I, I ran into this, and the reason why this has saved me is a database reset, like shut down the server and came back up. And I ended up shutting down my whole application. And I didn't know for a little while, but after I added this in, it gave it enough time that that server could come back in and test it, shutting it down. Um, some chaos monkey type of stuff. And it worked out really well. Um, so you have more chances for failure. And then the only thing that you have to deal with is catastrophic failure. So what happens when somebody unplugs the server? Uh, or something else on the server just shuts down so I don't get the terminate callback? Um, and, and that. There are, there are ways to handle them, but I'm not going to go over those today. Um, but because there, there are some other gotchas here. We have, we have expiration. So um, I wanted the password reset token to only last for 24 hours. And uh, I've, I've since moved on to the password reset token is generated as a signed key, an encryption key, and then I, I don't even have to store it. But, this has still been good for, for other data that I've been using. Um, but expiration-wise, too, if, you're, if you want to stay within Elixir itself, there is a library called CacheX that I found it's, uh, it builds a cache with time to live functionality, and it's very configurable. It's been pretty fantastic to use. Um, I haven't been able to dig into everything that it does, but it's got, it's got some really good stuff. I suggest checking it out. Uh, the other thing you can do is distribute your data. So using uh, Amnesia or just another Elixir process on another machine, like if you're already load balanced, you can push your failover out to other machines on a regular basis. And that way, whenever you, if your whole machine goes down, when it comes back up, it asks the other machine, hey, give me that. And it does add a wire protocol back in, but the, it's, it's all still Erlang or Elixir, and you're not pulling in new things. Um, and, and really, if you want a good understanding of how to deal with really distributed data and deletes, um, last year at ElixirConf EU, Chris McCord gave a talk on Phoenix 1.2 where he discusses Phoenix presence and how they implemented all that. And it's a very good place to dig into. Um, it's probably way more complicated than, than the data that I wanted to store, so I might keep all that in the database. And then binary data. So binary data uh, garbage collection uh, is pretty well documented. This can be an issue within Erlang. Um, it's it's done differently. If you there are 64 bytes is a magic number. Anything under 64 bytes is stored on the heap, just like every other process. And whenever that process goes away, that data goes away. 
It's just cleaned up. If it's over 64 bytes, it gets stored in what's called proc bin, and it's reference counted. And the reason why is whenever you try to break binary apart, instead of it copying that data over, it puts a pointer to that original 64 byte or larger binary data to a section of it. And so, since it's reference counted, it has a completely separate garbage collection from the rest of the Elixir garbage collection. And it will shut down your system pretty easily, I run into. Um, that garbage collection doesn't kick off until you have a memory pressure, is what it says in the early documentation. I found out it's about 90% of my system memory, and usually before the garbage collection can finish, my system crashes because of not the memory. Um, so be careful if you try to store any binary data at all. Uh, make sure it's under 64 or really pay attention to what you're doing with it. Store domain objects instead of storing binary. You convert them to some domain knowledge thing and store that instead. It works a lot better for you. Um, so the, the next step here in order to, to be a little more fault tolerant is ETS and DETS. Erlang term storage has been brought up a few times and heard people talking about it, and disk Erlang term storage. So you can still store native Elixir things in there, but the great thing about using those two in combination for your fail failover is that they use the same API. So I can take the same module inject whether it's using ETS or DETS, and use DETS for failover or more important data, write it to disk, and ETS for my regular in-memory, and just write it off to disk when I fail. Uh, which also gives us that if I crash, I have a known state somewhere on the, on the drive that I can look at. Uh, amnesia, um, it, I, I don't, haven't dug in a whole lot into it. If you go, Elixir School has a little section at the top that has four questions that tell you when you might want to choose amnesia over ETS. Um, and so that it's more distributed um, and has some, some different failover issues built into it that you can deal with. Uh, and then really my next step that I think is I want to write an application with no DB. And I, I really think that everybody should try that. So Josh, you should try this. Application. <laughs> Just see what happens. Um, I have an invoicing application that is all in Elixir, and I think I'm going to rewrite it with no database. Um, and hopefully, I don't lose my invoices. If I do, I'll have some really happy customers. Um, so, let's see how. So let's go over what it was. How to live like a hoarder. So agent's pretty good for temporal data. Things that you don't care about that you can load back up pretty easily. Current weather would be a fantastic place to put that. And the reason why you put it, in, it uh, the, re the only reason why you wouldn't want to use an agent is if you need some kind of termination callback. It does not give that to you. Um, even though agent feels like a great thing to just hurry up and jam a bunch of stuff in, I run it into very quickly that it's better for prototyping than having the let it crash and fail over mentality. So Gen Server is your friend um, because it, it gives you that ability to do failover. You can you can feel more confident that your data is there and that it's going to be taken care of. Make sure you push logic to the bottom. Logic is where your problems are going to be. You're probably not going to have as many crashes because you're trying to store into a map or your data. So push anything that's going to fail to the bottom of your super engine tree to give you more resources for those highs and lows. Uh, stack failover data on top, so keep data stored near the top of your tree. That's the safest place for it to be. The bottom of your tree is the stuff that fails all the time. The stuff at the top is the stuff that's going to stick around whenever you run into problems. Uh, keep data in its own process. So throughout all of this, I had put, I moved the calls to the database out into that backend process so that the front end could respond to the users right away. And I found out that when the database goes down, I was losing data, um, even if it was restarting. And that's because it was restarting that single app. But if you push the process or the business logic out to its own process and not have that stored data using tasks is a fantastic way. The restarts will will not affect your data. Your data 
is completely boxed in on its own. Uh, and always have a backup. ETS, you can back up to your engage base. Josh should probably do that because good job, Josh. <laughs> Uh, and then the, the top thing here is probably the only resource that you really need because all of them will be listed here. Um, GitHub.com slash binary noggin slash live like a hippie. There's an index file uh, and it will have all of these links in there. There's the link to Architecture of the Lost Years. It's the talk by uh, Uncle Bob. And I heard it mentioned a few times, it was already in my slides, but it was in it early. This article was actually the inspiration for me to say, why do I need some data? That and Joe Armstrong talking to people like every time they bring up a database, they're like, why do you need a database? And I figure if him and Uncle Bob will say, why do I need a database? Why do I need a database? Uh, there's the talk from Chris McCord, a uh, link to that, and then a link to CacheX, which has been beautiful. Um, and then uh, I'd like to thank Elixir Days for having me come out and this great conference. I thank all of you. And these guys help me out. Oliver Perini, he's uh, been writing early for a really long time. Um, Adam runs the St. Louis group, and, and Craig will check out my slides over and over. Uh, but I like to thank them. So uh, I guess I have, I have time for questions, uh, or you can just come and see me and talk to me afterwards. Uh, I don't know why they said had to put the thing at the top where it said passive aggressive. I thought it was pretty obvious, but <laughs> any, any questions? Thank you. You can see the recent password token 
preset. So this is the database version. Uh, and then this is all actually in that repo. This is like a little example app that I tried to put together. Um, so you can pull it up and play with it yourself. And so if we do this again, I will start out, I'll check uh, there's sys.getState is this brand new beautiful thing that has a different preset for. So we start out our failover storage is an empty map. Do I need to make that bigger? Can you guys see that? It's good. And our password reset forward is also an empty map when we start out. So Hard to spell X maple. So I got nothing returned back there. If I check the state now, this is a password <coughs> reset port. And the failover storage is still an empty map because I only place it in failover storage <coughs> when I fail. So uh, I actually store the entire user. I never have to go back to the database again whenever they come back for their reset password. And if we do gen server, oh, it's password and reset forward. Stay, thank you. Whoever said that, that I hit enter again. Um, so I reset. Now, if we look at our failover storage, it has that data in it. And if we go back to our uh, forward when it started up, it should ask that failover storage for it. So now I have a process that can stick, get killed, restart it as old data. Okay. Now I'm really done. Thank you.